There is one body. That's not my opinion. That's fact. That's what God said. And if God said it, it's a fact. Amen? Amen. Greek uh, lexicographer Thayer defined the word body as used in the scriptures. And the first couple of definitions are what we think of as people. He's talking about the human body. But there's also the figurative sense in which that word is used. And it's that third definition that applies to Paul's usage of the word body in Ephesians chapter 4 and throughout the book of Ephesians. That third definition is this. A number of men closely united into one society or family, as it were. A social, ethical, mystical body. And that's the sense that Paul has when he uses the word body in the book of Ephesians. There is one body. Now Paul doesn't leave us guessing as to what that body is. In fact, the word body is used nine times in this letter to the church at Ephesus. It's found in seven different passages. Those are listed for you in the bulletin. Let's look at the first one. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Paul says, And he, that is God, the Father, he put all things under his, that is Jesus, the Son's, feet, and gave him to be head. Over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul defines for us what is the body, the church, which is his body. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verses 14 through 16. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, Paul says, For he himself, speaking of Christ, he himself is our peace, who has made both one, talking about Jew and Gentile. He has made them both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So as to create in himself one new man. One new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. What is the body? It is the church. He broke down the middle wall of separation. He put to death or, or put, put the, the law of commandments were put aside at his death in order to bring Jew and Gentile together in one body, in one church, to reconcile them to God in one church, one body through the cross. Thereby putting to death the enmity. Drop down to chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. Paul is talking here about the mystery. And that mystery is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. What is the body? It is the church. The Gentiles should be partakers of of the heirs of the same body of the same church partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel 
And then we have it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul saying there is one body. How did Paul define the word body? Church. There is one church. A little bit later in chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. In this passage, we're going to see the word body three times. He says, he himself, again speaking of Jesus, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body, the church of Christ. So we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, they may grow up in all things unto him who is the head. Christ. Christ is the head. Remember Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, made him the head of the body, the head of the church, from whom, from Christ, the whole body, the whole church joined and knitted together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body, the church, for the edifying of itself in love. And then in chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. What is the body? It is the church. He is the savior of the church. And then in verse 30, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body. We are members of his church. his flesh and of his bones. This is how Paul describes the church throughout the book of Ephesians, the one church, the church over which Christ is the head. There's nobody else who has the authority in the church that Christ has. So what is the importance of the body? What is the importance of the one body? Well, we just read Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife. Just as the Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. If you've got your outline, you'll see there's a blank there. Christ is the Savior of the body. How many bodies are there? If he is the Savior of the body, it's a pretty good idea to figure out what body he's talking about, right? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body. He is the Savior of the body. There is one body. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. What is the body? We've answered this question about seven times already this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. What is the body? Let's read it again. Because it's the words of God. Not the words of Jason, the map. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet 
and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus is the Savior of the body. There is one body. The church is his body. That's scripture. That's not opinion. It's fact. How many churches are there? Now we can use our powers of deduction based on the scriptures we just read to figure that out. We can also turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 also answers that question for us. Jesus and his disciples are in Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks his apostles, he says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, well, some people say you're, you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets or Elijah. He said to them, who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, on that rock of your confession, on the words that you just said, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus didn't say churches. He said, I will build my church. Paul, in another place, used the same argument based on the singular use of the word seed rather than seeds to prove his point. Logic tells us we can do the same. <clears throat> Jesus said, I will build my church, singular. Paul said, there is one body, singular. He said, that body is the church, singular. And Jesus is the Savior of that body. Can one be saved outside the body? Outside the church. Does it matter. Which church. We belong to. You know when you look at the. Yellow pages. And Chris and I were talking about this earlier this week. There are hundreds. Of different churches. In Grant County. You've got so many different churches as you drive down the road. How do you know which one is the one body? Does it matter? When God told Noah to build the ark, he told him the specifications by which to build it. The measurements, the type of wood to use, how many animals to take on the ark. Does it matter that Noah followed what God said? If he had said, okay, God, I know you told me to build it so long, but you know what? I don't know that that's going to be enough space for all the animals you told me to bring on the ark, so I'm going to make it a little bit longer. That ark would have sunk. Noah knew that he had to obey God. 
He had to do exactly what God told him to do. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 22, Moses said, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Now suppose Noah had a neighbor who saw this man, this crazy man, according to society. He saw him building an ark. He said, what you building an ark for? Because there's a flood coming. And maybe that neighbor said, you know what? Maybe he's right. Maybe there is a flood coming. Maybe I need to build an ark too. And so he built it to the best of his ability. He didn't look at what Noah was doing. He didn't follow God's instructions. He didn't, he didn't change his life. He was still living just as everybody else was living in society. The thoughts of, of men were, were on evil continually. Would it matter which ark Noah got on? Noah's family? You get on the ark that God told you to build. In the way that God told you to build it, right? Now, let's fast forward a little bit. Let's, let's go past the patriarchal age. Let's get into the Mosaic age. Joshua and the armies are getting ready to invade Jericho. Joshua sends these spies into Jericho. And, and there's a woman there, a harlot, who shows the spies kindness. She hides them and then says, please save me and my family. And so the men said to her, Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Let's go ahead and begin in verse 17. The men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brother, and your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. And we will be guiltless. Whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. If a hand is laid on him. Does it matter which house they went into? If they're not in Rahab's home. Their blood is on their own head, right? <clears throat> Let's fast forward a little bit more. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, the Syrian named Naaman, he has leprosy. And he sends for the prophet Elisha, and he wants Elisha to, to heal him. And Elisha sent word back to go wash in the Jordan seven times. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 10. Wash in the Jordan seven times. And your flesh shall be restored to you. And you shall be clean. Well, what was Naaman's reaction? Naaman became furious. He expected more out of the prophet. He became furious. He went away. He said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me. And stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the far far the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. What was wrong with just doing what God said to do through his prophet Elisha? Naaman didn't want to hear it. Naaman wanted something more. 
Too many in the religious world want something more. They want a Damascus type of event in their life. They want to be specifically, individually called. The faith has been once delivered for all. The gospel calls all of us. God has told us what we need to do. Please don't react like Naaman. Don't react in such a way that I deserve more. Your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Not a single one of us deserve his grace. That's why it's called grace. We don't deserve it. But he loves us. And he gives us the opportunity to be a part of his body. So that leads to the question. How does one become a part of the body? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Jesus is the Savior of the body, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. There is one body, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. The body is the church, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. We are baptized into the one body. 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 13. Do I have to be baptized? If he is the savior of the body. And we are baptized into the body. The answer should be evident. Yes. I have to be baptized. For the remission of sins, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. I have to be baptized to have my sins washed away, Acts 22 and verse 16. I have to be baptized based upon my belief to be saved, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. You are all baptized into Christ. You're baptized into his death. Our baptism is a reenactment of the gospel. The death, we die to our sins. Just as Jesus died in the flesh on the cross. We are buried into the water. Just as Jesus was put into the tomb, he was buried in the tomb. We are raised. To walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6. Verses 3 and 4. Just as Jesus was raised on that third day. And we will be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. If we trust him. If we obey him. First Peter chapter 3. Verse 21. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Do I have to be baptized to be part of the body? To be saved in the body? Yes. The scriptures bear that out. Do I have to understand everything that goes along with that? Do I have to know Matthew chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 22 to obey the gospel? No. That's called growth. If you're waiting until you know enough, you'll never obey. Because we'll never know enough. What you need to know is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to this earth. He lived a sinless, perfect life so that he could be offered up on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. If you believe that he is the Son of God and that he is the Savior of the body, you can become a part of his body Today, believe what the Bible says about him. Repent of the things that you've done in your life that don't measure up to the standards of the New Testament. Confess your belief before those who are gathered here today. And be immersed. To have those sins washed away. And then as you continue to grow and you continue to learn and you discover other things. You take care of those things when you discover them. Not a single one of us deserve it. But he has given us this opportunity to trust him. And to obey him. If you are a member of the body. But you have discovered some things. That are in your life recently. That, that need to be fixed. You need to repent of those things. If you want the chair. The, the, the prayers of the church. We'll be happy. To pray for you. And with you. And to help you. Resolve those issues that you have you're not yet a member of the body of Christ please make that decision this morning and you will submit to that immersion in water and you'll leave this building as a child of God cleansed of your sins trust him obey him Respond as we stand and as we sing. <clears throat>